Welcome back to WPC Plus. That's the Weighted Pod Traded. I'm Pierre Camus, aka the Roto Chef of Roto Baller. Nicholas Scott, of course, with me. Not but Reynolds still to this day. Preseason <laughs> ATC projections have just dropped. So Ariel Cohen is here to talk about most overvalued and undervalued pitchers based on our very early look at these predictions. So first of all, Ariel, thanks for coming back and uh, welcome. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm so glad to be back. How are you guys doing? How has uh, has been the off season been treating you so far? Not too bad. Glad you know. Nice to uh, you know have at least decent reasons to believe that this is not going to be a never ending off season like last year's never ending off season. So uh, feels nice to just kind of do some normal prep for the season. And uh, will there be a DH in the NL? Uh, and by the way it does not matter as much for hitters. Like maybe it'll matter for Dominique Smith, but it matters so much more for pitchers, right? It's, it's the, the earn run average in the national league was higher than the earn run average in the American league last year, the first time in a long time. Yeah. So it's actually a very big thing in terms of valuing. Um, you can bump up almost a dollar or two or a round or two, some uh, AL pitchers versus the NL. If we know what the story is, right? That begs the question, Ariel is how do you go about projecting so much unknown? And of course, Talk about the craziness of 2020 based on last year's results. How much do you take that into account, you know, based on previous seasons? Now, the nice thing about ATC is that uh, I gain the wisdom of the crowds. I follow what uh, the other projection experts are doing. As far as the DH, most people are projecting the DH. So when you, when, and that's something that I, I didn't know until I asked everybody. When you see projections put out by all the people, it's almost all of them are projecting it as if the NL will have a DH. You should know that. Um, so you're going to have to touch it down for those, uh, you know, for those batters and, and up for the uh, down for the pitchers, at least in the NL, uh, if you, we see anything different. Um, as far as 2020, um, I, I wrote a paper on this uh, a, a month or two ago. Um, the automatic projections are not waiting 2020 a bit. They're basically giving it only credit for 60 out of 162 games. In the three-year average, they're going to give uh, the 2019 year more credibility than the 2020 year, which is odd, right? Usually you have the most recent year more. The more manual projections people are giving – almost regular credit to 2020 they're looking at the trend so um you know there's a combination of both atc does a little bit of both uh you're going to get some kind of average like 33 percent 2020 is counting just as much as the other two years uh all, almost as as equally to the other two years so um some credit not enough credit uh another way to express it is that atc is counting 2020 um as if it was an 81 game season if that makes sense, not a 60 game season. So more credibility, but not that much more. Right. Yeah. No, that definitely makes sense. And, you know, Nick, I know you've been working on the NBR projections this off season and uh, a lot of what you've talked about in your early uh, articles writing, you've kind of had this mind frame of we're taking the second half of 2019 and you know, what we had of 2020 and looking at that as kind of a more solid sample to replace what would have been a full season. And of course, there's, you know, pros and cons to that too, because a lot of people will say, well, just throw out 2020 completely, right? You know, the, the scheduling is weird, the part factors, all the stuff, the DH. So what's your approach um, to that? Yeah, so partly like you, like you said, you know, looking at, <clears throat> I like looking at, you know, seasons as halves anyway. So, you know, looking at the, first and second half of 2019 along with what amounted to, you know, not, not quite a half a season, but close like a second half of a season in 2020. And, you know, doing my projections, it is, it's, uh, it kind of depends on the category, the ratio categories, um, particularly batting average. I, 2020, I am, I, I barely, barely used it. Uh, weighted, weighted way down low. I'm, I'm not throwing it out completely, but uh, relative to what I would in a normal year, I, I kind of am. The, the other, the uh, like the power stats, I'm believing a lot more. You know, we talk a lot about. I get a lot into uh, the exit velocities and different ranges of like top end exit velocities, and I, I, I think there's a fair amount of truth in those, even in just 60 games. So. 
you know, it's, it's a case by case basis on a lot of things, but as a, as a general rule of thumb, I've been re really uh, waiting, uh, waiting down batting average in 2020 and keeping, uh, keeping my, my, my weights and thoughts on the power categories as if 2020 was closer to a regular season. Yeah, and that's uh, to me that's a smart approach. Exactly, like you said the ratios, the averages are going to have a lot more variations. Obviously, with a smaller sample, and there's so many pitchers. I was digging in the other day doing a, an article on some you know deeper league pitcher targets and how many you find where this one game you know doubled their ERA or you know blew things out of proportion. Yeah, uh, and a guy like your you know in St. Louis there, Jack Flirty was doing great, and then just a complete meltdown in this one start. You know, you know skewed his ratios and. You know, that might affect ADP in a lot of senses, but uh, let's see how it affects the projections. That's the main thing. Quick question. You know, the Cardinals and maybe the Marlins also, they really got screwed up the whole year with, you know, they missed two weeks in a row and whatnot. Yeah. Do, do you buy the the last year's stats even less from, like, Cardinals players? Like, a guy like Tommy Edmond really didn't do that well last last year. You're close to it with the Cardinals, right? You're Cardinals fan. Yeah. Um, do you buy those projections less? Do you buy the statistics less from last year, even more so for the, from the Cardinals and and maybe the Marlins? Yeah, on 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 those on those teams in particular, like you said, it was such a you know besides everything else, it was an extra wonky season for. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know how many weeks the Cardinals went without playing a game, um, and so it's it's I give uh, kind of everything with them is. You know, like I was saying, I, I'll believe a lot of the 2020 stuff in the power sets for the Cardinals and the Marlins as well. Like I'm, I'm, I'm going to need to do some deep. I have to do deep. It's a very case by case basis because I'm just I'm not believing very much of 2020. Like the, the the numbers are just so slight and just that's they they're they're an extra special case in an already like year of special cases. So yeah, I think that's a good point. Like they're just it's and like Pierre said with Jack Flaherty and that's with a lot of pitchers it's right. one or two games like you know yeah. Seth, remember how good Seth Lugo was doing until Seth, Seth, Seth Lugo right. tanked right. every one season that had him uh right. he went from right. the most one of the most valuable pitchers to one of the least valuable pitchers in uh like a week and a half so yeah. Uh, so yeah with with all the all the pitchers and the ratios and stuff like that but it's like you said, especially with the Cardinals, like I'm, I mean, I'm a known Cardinal hater. So I, I, I have my, I have plenty of issues with, uh, with the Cardinals hitters that don't involve what they do and did in 2020. Yeah. You know, with the Marlins, Jacob DeGrom actually pitched four consecutive starts against the Marlins, basically one month out of the two and a quarter months, uh, Jacob DeGrom only faced Marlins. Like it was just, just a crazy, crazy, crazy year, right? It's, it's, it's nuts. Speaking of schedule, too, that's another thing. How many, you know, pitchers had the benefit of playing in one of the central divisions? You know, a lot of chatter now with Trevor Bauer still waiting to see where he's going to sign about the schedule he faced. He had a pretty easy, you know, facing some, you know, opponents like the Pirates multiple times and, you know, Detroit and things like that. So it's, I mean, it's, it's all fair game to question. But, again, you have to dig into you know, the case by case basis, because it depends. Um, so what we want to do is look at some of the pitchers in the early ATC projections and try to figure out who does ATC uh, maybe like a little bit more better than uh, current ADP is showing and vice versa. Now, we're not going to go super deep on any one player, right? Because this is we've just had time to barely, you know, start digesting all these projections. And of course, when I say like, you know, the, the projections themselves, everyone here should be familiar with ATC by now. Um, if not, then go read any of the multiple articles that, you know, Ariel has written and Nick has written on this subject. But basically, it's, like you said, the, uh, I, I guess, well, how you explain it? It's, it's almost like crowdsourcing all the projections that are already out there and, you know, compiling it and getting a consensus on, on what makes the most sense. 
Yeah, if you think that projections are, you know, a nice computer way and, and they're precise because they're formulaic uh, of, of not going by someone's heart, it, it goes by the numbers. Well, ATC takes a number of projections, some manual, some formulaic, automatic, and it's, it's studied them to know, you know, this one's really good for homers, this one's really good for stolen bases, this projection is really good for this, and it takes different parts of each blends them together to give a very good average, very good aggregate projection set that's very stable and it's very accurate over year over year. Um, so I tell people, if you want to start with a base of projections, why not start with ATC? Because they give you all the project, or the, all the better projections all in one shot. Of course, if you don't like a projection, if you think something looks wrong, go ahead and change it, but it's a good place to start. So um, you know that if ATC tells you that a player looks like a really big bargain, it means that all the projections tell you it's a really big bargain. So that's where I start my first glance is just to look at, hey, what's ATC saying? Right. And so not just to, to clarify in case anybody's confused, ATC is not Ariel going and saying, yeah, I think this guy's going to do this. Let's put him down. It's not your projection personally even though it got your initials on it but yeah <laughs> just, just to make yeah sure. no i don't it's not my intuition it's my research and mathematics and i'm surprised by anybody when i booked the da and here it comes and well this is what atc says now of course me as an analyst i don't just take it for granted i then comb it and say okay this looks right this looks right i agree with this maybe this one this player maybe is a little bit lucky here you know and and maybe projections didn't catch something so i'll i'll see what i think is interesting and not um but no it comes from there oddly enough though um if you just go by atc and not even do any kind of uh bump up bump down you'll be good uh fantasy pros said last year and i i my projections my, my rankings that i give for fantasy pros just whatever atc spits out that was number one ranking. So you don't, you don't have to do anything there. It's, it's good on its own. Um, in fact, don't do too much because if you might be right one here, but for every three people that you're right, you're going to be wrong for four people. So, you know, in the long term, don't go too far off of ATC. You'll, you'll find yourself doing more harm than not. Makes sense. All right. So we started breaking down some of these numbers. And again, let's just kind of get our quick thoughts on some players that are maybe over and undervalued. Let's start at the top. And these players, of course, being among the first drafted as starting pitcher are likely to be a little more overvalued based on what ATC says. Uh, let's talk about Trevor Bauer. Now, I know it's hard to go, you know, too deep in him because, well, we don't know where he's going to pitch yet. So that would affect things. Um, so, Nick, let's start with your opinion on Bauer. Uh, we talked about the schedule. Obviously, that could have played a factor. Um, you know, he's he's had one season similar, of course, not quite as dominant uh, as his Cy Young season, but one season similar, but he's also had a couple of down seasons where the ERA was a lot higher. Where, where do you see him heading this year, wherever he lands? And do you feel like he's going to be overvalued based on what ATC is saying and that he is? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm I, I like Bauer fine. I hate his draft price like he is this idea that. <clears throat> You know, he's always going to get a lot of healing and a lot of attention because he's Trevor Bauer. But also going into a year where a lot of people, like we've already talked about, a lot of people are worried about how many how many innings pitchers are really going to pitch. And we've already heard from lots of teams saying there's going to be restrictions. And so in all this chaos of, uh, you know, trying to guess how many, how much pitchers will pitch, we have Trevor Bauer who – is coming out and saying, I'm going to pitch every fourth day. I'm going to pitch, you know, 400 innings or whatever. And, you know, it's the skills and the strikeout rate and all, all the good things about Bauer, even though he's not exactly consistently great. But I think a lot of it's driven by people are dreaming of 200 innings uh, in a year where, you know, maybe no one else gets 200 or maybe only a couple other people. And, you know, I'm of that opinion that there's going to be a lot of a lot of pitchers that in years past would be in the, you know, 180 to 190 range are going to be in the 160 to 170 range. So I think that's driving a lot of the Bauer height, but his, you know, ADP is just too high. Like I'd, I'd, there's, I'd rather have, you know, clarity at his price, or I'd rather have Darvish at regardless of price over, Bauer. So at his at his draft price, I'm not going to get a lot of him, but 
I, I get I get the dreams of the bulk of innings. All right, Ariel, uh, ATC, not super low on him, but uh, as of right now, seeing that he is uh, ranked overall 27 and his ADP is 16, uh, he's not making it out of the second round of any draft, really. Some places might be even going higher. Uh, were you surprised, or do you think that this is fair? And, and how much do you think landing spot really does matter for a guy like him? Um, I mean, landing spot um, probably doesn't matter all that much. It's more a question of, you know, last year maybe wasn't representative. So th there's, there's a couple things I want to say about Trevor Bauer. First of all, last year, yes, he pitched in the NL Central. That was obviously a benefit. Um, he was somewhat lucky. The BABIP that he gave up was 215. For those of you who are familiar with BABIP, um, a pitcher does not really control – if there's a ground ball, whether his fielders are going to scoop it up or not. Um, in general, sometimes there's a little bit more luck, a little bit lower, uh, less luck. A 300 BABIP would mean that about three out of 10 balls are going for hits and stuff, stuff that's beyond his control. He had a 215. That's really low. So there was a lot less hits, a lot fewer hits than probably should have been if he pitched a regular season. His lifetime BABIP is 294, which is normal. That's going to stabilize. That'll put his batting average against him higher. How about his ground ball rate? Um, it's been trailing downwards. It's at 34%. A couple of years ago, it was at 44%. Um, he's giving up less ground balls, more fly balls. I have a feeling that there could be more homers in store for him. Um, so you never know. Uh, here's another thing. His um, strand rate. Strand rate is a measure of per batters who get on, how many he holds, how many he scores. An average would be around 70, 75, something like that. He was 91% last year. Only 9% of those batters scored on him. That is immensely, immensely lucky. His career average is 74. So there's no doubt whatever luck metric you want to use, as I'm showing, lucky. How about ERA versus FIP and XFIP? ERA 173, FIP is 288, XFIP 325. That's a large gap. He is not. He is not a 173 pitcher. No way. Um, ATC is showing a lot of variance. So I have a new statistics this year from ATC. Not only do I give you the average of ATC, but I have a measure. Of, it's called interprojectional standard deviation and interprojectional skew. It lets you know how, how much there's a range of all the values from all the underlying projections. Some players is very little range and projections are pretty short. Some they're all over the place. They're all over the place for Bauer. Bauer has got five. Uh, just to give you a sense, a normal one would be around three, three and a half dollar value five. So projections are much, much uh, all over the place. So there's some uncertainty. Here's the thing though. How many pitch, how many pitchers this year are going to hit 200 innings? How many pitchers are you sure are going to just pitch a lot? Very few. I think this year, having innings is a big, big, big deal, right? Um, I, don't, I don't know that teams are going to – some teams might say we're not going to let anybody pitch 100 more than last year. So if a pitcher pitched 60 innings, they might not let him pitch more than like 160. Um, I don't fear that with Bauer. I think that although the teams might not, be able, might not let him do the ridiculous uh, pitch every four-day thing – Teams will let him pitch the whole year. He can accumulate 200 innings. He's one of the most highest probability to gain that. That's a huge advantage. The strikeouts, totally real. Look at his change. He's now 12K per nine, totally real. He's going to get you the strikeouts, going to get you the innings. If you project an ERA of much higher, so ATC has it at 3.67, which probably somewhat reasonable. His whip 1.16 sounds somewhat reasonable. If you can believe the jump in ERA, he's a very useful pitcher. So even though ATC against the market maybe shows a little bit, a little bit less, the market is right because he's a unique commodity and he's a really good one. And he's probably going to pitch on a good team. He didn't sign with anybody, but he's going to pick a team that's going to score runs for him. And he's got a chance to win games much more than the Reds. So um, I can't fault the market for doing that. Um, I personally, myself, maybe think the jump is a little bit too much by the market. But I can't fault them. I don't think this is a huge ATC is right versus the market. I think there's risk management that Bauer really makes sense this year. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. Absolutely. And, and you know, we know that starting pitching, you know, elite starting pitching is going to be at a premium even more so than last year. 
Uh, so yeah, I, I, I agree because how many pitchers, like you said, of his caliber who are going to at least have the, the chance to hit that 200 inning threshold or get close to it, how many are there going to be left after round two? You know, not that many. So, um, you know, and I agree if you make a case where you say, well, I prefer a guy like Darvish. Yeah, that, that's perfectly fine. But Darvish is gone and you're on the clock there. You're around sure, pick 16, sure. 17. I mean, yeah, so it's just a decision you're going to have to make. He is an incredibly safe pick. Like, I, I understand the lure of all those innings. Um, it's and it's not even like it's, it's not even that I, I besides Darvis like in pitchers of his range there's no pitchers I really think that are better or a, a safer bet than bet than uh, Bauer and if he went in drafts where he dropped to like twenty ish like where I can get him around there uh, I like him quite a bit but I, I've been in a couple a couple drafts so far and he he's gone at the end of the first round like pick fourteen fifteen and I'm just like ah. That that I have a hard time doing. I'd, I'd probably rather take uh, hitters around there, but uh, I, I understand the safety. Like he's going to pile up a whole uh, a whole mess of innings, and you know if he if if he signs with the Mets, uh, with them shipping out mats, if they're making room for Bauer, uh, you know if, if you would think a lot with all the Mets have done, you would think a lot more wins are going to be coming his way than he had with the Reds. Absolutely. And to, to me, it's not a case of having so many guys above Bauer. There's really not that many. Like you said, it, it's more uh, the decision is, do I pull the trigger now or just wait another round maybe and get a guy like Luis Castillo instead? Um, if yeah, assuming sure. he's available. <laughs> but another guy right. who, who might be that other right. option in that next round is Lucas Giolito. Yeah. And there's a little bigger discrepancy here. And again, not that ATC... Hates him per se, uh, but right now he's going as the, I think, sixth pitcher off the board. And uh, ATC has him as the 12th ranked starting pitcher uh, based on projections. Uh, his ADP is 19.6 on average and uh, should be closer to 46, according to ATC. So uh, let's talk a little bit about Giolito. Um, Ariel, you can start. Do you, were you surprised by that or do you feel like he's also being a little overvalued? I don't have any big complaints about G Lito. Um, he seems like he's poised. He seems like he's ready to make the next step. Um, he, he, I would value him really close to where Bauer is going um, in terms of ERA. I, you're not going to get this uh, tremendous, tremendous ERA. I, I know he had a 3 4 eight ERA last year, 3 4 1 the year before. Um, I think it could be a touch lucky. His whip seems a little bit low. Pro projections, for some reason, are much higher. For some reason, I'm deferring to projections, and they don't have him repeating the 104 whip, 106 whip that he's done in the, in the past couple of years. Um, you know, he, his ERA and whip numbers have just the projections are taking him higher. Uh, what really dominates is his strikeout ability here, um, and he has the potential to win a lot of games coming on the uh, on the White Sox. Um, I don't think he has the ability to pitch uh, 200 innings yet. He did have a nice amount of innings last year, 72, he, in the 170 last couple of years. Um, maybe I'm wrong. May, maybe he'll, he'll make it closer to there. Um, his projections are all over the place. I've got a, um, an interprojectional standard deviation of $6.7. Um, really interesting. Um, uh, and and uh, it, the skew on it, uh, a new thing, the skew on it is $2, which means that there's some projection that's so high on him that it's just skewing the average upwards there. Really weird. Most projections are of the lower, lower than the ATC average, actually, and it's being skewed by this one thing that's over. Um, you know, I, I, he's, he's pretty much similar to Bauer. He's, I have him as pretty interchangeable. I have Giolito as ranked as a uh, $24 auction value in a five by five, 15 team format Bauer at $28. Th there's a whole mess of people in that range all the way from Darvish to about maybe Snell Giolito around there. That's within three, $4. Once you pass the top three, it gets pretty, pretty in the middle. So the question to me is really, do you think that Giolito is going to be this 200 inning pitcher or close to it? Uh, if so, the strikeouts are there. I just don't think he's going to help your ratios. I, I like my pitchers to, give a little bit more in the ratio there. And I'm not sure I can count on it. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's, I don't think there's upside. I think there's downside to, to the ratios. Do you agree? Or, or I, I think everyone, I, I, for some reason, I think people think 
much higher, much more highly than than I do on Giolito. Like I, I don't envision taking any of Giolito this year. Yeah, once again, I I, I, I like the pitcher. I I hate the price. I mean, in eighty around a twenty ADP for Giolito. When you like you said, it's you know I'm I'm the same way of the pitchers. It's 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 Degrom, Cole, and Bieber, and then it is a, a it's like ten guys. And, uh, you know, I, I think Darv- Darvish and Bauer separate themselves a little at the top of those 10 guys. But then there's a, a, a lot, uh, there's a, a bigger glob than normal, I think. And Giolito at that price is just not going to be one of them for me, even though I actually, I've, I've settled into believing, like, I, I'm probably, you know, more favorable on, you know, I think uh, ATC is, project him for an ERA of three, eight, four. And I, you know, I, I doubted him going into 2020. Uh, but I, I think I, I, I see him more as a closer to a three, five, uh, ERA, uh, more bullish than ATC. And I think the bat also has him around three, eight, eight or so, but you know, after last year, you know, he's, his ex Sierra, uh, FIPS are, always it, since he became, you know, the new and improved Giolito uh, these past two seasons, they've, they all kind of stay around three, four, three, five. So I am, uh, I, I, I think I'm going to believe it this year. And the strikeout rate is for real that, that, that there's no doubt of, I don't like, I, he's never going to, he's always going to be like a nine, nine percent walk, uh, walk rate kind of pitcher. And that's, uh, I, I like, I like Ariel was saying, I like my, I like my pitchers with uh, shinier ratios as well. And I, I like his ERA, but whips a little much, but that eight, that 20 ADP when there's just so many pitchers that I think can be just as good as him about a round later, uh, at least then I'm just, I, I, I don't think I'll have any, any Giolito this year. When you're playing fantasy baseball and it is much easier to come back from a lower level of strikeout than if you've inflated your ERA, right? If you're half the season and you've controlled your ERA, then you can throw in another starting pitcher every so often instead of a reliever. You can throw two star pitchers in with less concern of the ERA blow up because you've banked that ERA there. So it, it's not, it, and there's going to be pitchers available, right? There's always somebody, especially in a shallow league, available on the waiver wire. What you can't come back is if you blow up your ERA. Like, how are you gonna how are you gonna adjust that? You're gonna really throw more relievers in. Well, they're not gonna give you enough innings to do that. Um, it's much much harder to come back. So I always put more emphasis on a better ERA pitcher. Um, I'd much rather take a, a Blake Snell who's going somewhere around it, or a Luis Castillo that I think's gonna probably beat Giolito out in ERA. If it's all the same, even if he has a little bit more strikeouts short a little bit more wins i can pick up a couple more of the counting stats and adjust to what i need later on so from a team management perspective i'd much rather play the ratio person if that makes sense to you oh absolutely uh, and i'll tell you you know it's, a lot has changed the last couple of years talking about last season and heading into this season with relievers becoming more of a factor I mean, everyone's chasing those elite starting pitching uh, options early, right, to try to lock down the ratios, and, you know, pile up Ks. And it's it's almost to the point, right, you have to have that market correction at some point where you might be able to zig with other zag. I'm kind of, I know everyone here is familiar with the Lima plan, right, an old tried and true thing. And, it, you know, some people say you can't do that anymore. And I'm almost tempted to just say, you know, I'm going to get my one ace early and then, I'm just going to load up on offense. I'm not going to be chasing those guys who I think are overvalued, like Giolito and Ina Bauer. And I'll get those guys that are just a, you know, a tier or two down below rather than stacking up on some guys. Because there's some other pictures we haven't even talked about also, again, based on ATC projections, that seem like there's a massive discrepancy between you know perceived value and actual value. Um, but anyways, the strategy talk, we'll, we'll save for another time because we've gone forever about that. Um, but let me get your thoughts uh Nick, pick one or two of these guys that um, you kind of have a strong opinion on because Zach Gallen, Lance Lynn, Corbin Burns, and Zach Lisak all going within the first 60 picks overall. And right now, um, Gallen's the only one that ATC even has falling within the top 100. 
uh, in terms of early projections. Which of those guys are you, let's do this, you most a believer in and, and who do you agree probably the most that it is over Uh Well, anyone to read me know that I'm, I'm a well-known Corbin Burns uh, fanboy uh, as, as well as Zach Plesak to a certain extent, but those are two more, you know, I, I, I'm going against a lot of pitchers that I like. I like the talent a lot more then I like the uh, possible innings and I really I'm more most concerned about that with uh, Corbin Burns just because of Milwaukee's history of uh, they they don't really push their pitchers along in cre- young pitchers along incredibly fast in normal years so I can't expect they're going to do it in a year following a pandemic and I just I I stress to see you know to see Burns even reaching like 150 innings. I think that's really going, I, I think even 150 is probably going to be pushing it. I love the talent. Um, you know, I, 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 I've written about him a few times. I, I believe all this, all the things that happened last year, he, he got rid of a terrible four seam fastball, uh, swapped it in for an excellent two seam fastball and has had one of the best sliders in baseball for a couple of years now. And, uh, he, elite velocity, a dialed in pitch mix. I love all those things. I hate his draft, you know, I hate his top 50 draft price. And I hate that I, I, I think he's going to get about 150 innings. So that's, that's, uh, that, that's one guy that I'm, I, I'm not going to have on as many teams as I, I want to. And, and at least when I get guys like that, like guys like Plesak as well, uh, Denilson Lamette's another guy, guys whose innings I'm real even more concerned about than normal. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna need to be part of an overall pitching strategy. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to be backing those guys up with probably quite a few uh, more premium relievers to uh, kind of buffer myself against fewer innings. Sense and Ariel, uh, what about you? Which of those guys stand out the most? Well, I don't love either of them for the price. Um, maybe Zach Gallon has the most upside, if that makes sense. Um, he's been a little bit on the lucky side, although I can see his ERA metrics being decent. But it, I call your attention to 2020. Does anybody know who led the major leagues in innings pitched last year? Lance Lynn. Lance innings. Lynn. I should have known. He's, he's a lot of innings, but especially innings. 84 innings. This is a guy who pitches a lot. He pitches deep into games. Um, Zach Gallen actually pitched 72 innings. That was number 12. So of the four, I'm going to enjoy Gallen and Lynn. I think that none of these guys are going to be your ace. I think that it depends who you're pairing it with. If you need somebody for more volume, Lance Lynn, although he'll probably have something like around a four ERA, I think that you might want to pair him to get that volume. If you need a little bit more upside and if you pick a stable guy, maybe you've picked Garrett Cole already, um, you might want Gallon. Uh, so I think it really depends on who you have there. For the price, all of these guys are somewhat overvalued. I, I, I don't like throwing my darts in the middle. To me, this year is like take the Grum Cole Bieber. Maybe there's a cheap Tyler Glass now that you think is underpriced or Snell or one of these guys. Maybe you think Kershaw's arm won't fall off or his back will be fine. But I'm I'm passing on these guys. Other than Lance Lynn seems interesting for, for the uh for the volume and, and Gallon. I, I think this guy has a lot of upside. I mean, you know, the Marlins know how to draft pitchers. Um and right away to the Diamondbacks, right there. I mean, you're a Marlins fan, right? Thank you for uh producing so many of them. I mean, you give them away, but thank you. Marlins are great at drafting. That part of base. The, the all ex Marlins team would be a Hall of Fame caliber squad. I mean, that's, that's, there's no, they would be the best team in baseball, right? If you don't oh, limit yeah. contracts, uh, we, look at that outfield, Ozuna, Stanton, Yelich, um, you know, that pitching staff, Luis Castillo, uh, Chris Paddock, if I, right? Uh, just, uh, yep, I mean, Allen. Uh, so, just twisting the knife. Gallon. You're just twisting the knife there. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> you're in our, you're in my Mets division, so uh, you know. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, I, uh, yeah, I like, I like, I'm, I'm, I'm same boat as Lynn. He is, uh, he, he's not the flashiest 
pick, but the Lance Lynn we've gotten since like midway through 2018 has been remarkably consistent. And, you know, we were talking about Bauer earlier and you, you, you want to bank all of those nice safe innings. And I, I see kind of Lynn as a, a, a lesser version of, you know, not as high as strikeout rate and, uh, not, you know, the, the ratios, the upside, and like he's going to have around a four ERA. That's, there's not a lot of up, upside on the ratios, but. No, there is. He, I mean, he almost won a, a Cy Young. So there's a little bit of upside. Right? Oh yeah. Uh, if, if he can do that again, I, like he, his value is always like it's, it's, I had Lance Lynn on a lot of teams last year as, because he was going around an ADP of like 100, 110. And I just, I just kept plucking him up because I knew the innings was going to be there. And uh, I think that's the same. I, I'd much rather have Lance Lynn at his draft price than Reese for Bauer at yeah. the end of the first round. There's, there's, there's no upside though in Lynn. Like if I read you the last four years, auction value is $12. A below replacement 15 18 like he's not going to turn into a 20 dollar pitcher but there's little chance he's going to bust or or i should say little there's less of a chance to bust than than most um and projections are really really stable the interprojection volatility is two dollars which is again the average is about three three and a half very very low uh and the skew is zero so projections are just in a nice um normal curve right around it you're getting a four era pitcher with maybe a one, two whip. Um, he'll get you enough for wins. He, he's a 200 strikeout pitcher, by the way. I mean, yeah. he, he had 246 strikeouts in 2019 last year. He had 89 strikeouts in 84 That's a pace of 240 strikeouts. So you, you're getting the strikeouts with him. There's not much wrong with Lance Lynn. Um, and he's durable. He's, you know, fought off early career unstability instability. He's been pretty durable. So uh, he's, so, there's a value in trustworthiness. And he's another. He's a guy that, it, it, you know, in the drafts I've been in so far, I think just because of people tend not to give him as much credit. And you see, like, you know, there's respect in his ADP. His AD, you know, his ADP is around 50, 55. But in actual drafts, he's, in, if you're looking at that, like, group of pitchers uh, that, you know, are all grouped around there in the, you know, 30 to 60 range, He's the guy I think is going to fall in a lot of drafts just because you'll, you'll have some drafts where, you know, people are sharp and they're going to recognize the value of Lance Lynn. But some drafts, they're just – they're not going to give him cr- the same credit as guys being drafted around him like Blake Snell and Glass now and Bistek Burns, et cetera. And so he's, he's – I, I, I like guys with boring names that uh, yeah. fall in drafts. Yeah, and, and, you know, the point stands to what you said earlier. It, it kind of will influence, you know, the way you go early in this, you know, one of these guys might be SP2, or maybe even SP1, depending on how late you wait. But that kind of influences the, the way you go with the roster construction. Because, again, a guy like, well, all these guys, I think, have the strikeout upside. But, you know, down a little safer with ratios more so than Lynn. Uh, Lynn, you get safety of the innings. You know he's probably going to log a full workload where you don't have that with Burns, you know, so there's kind of a trade-off here, um, you know, depending on where you go. If you, if you go with Burns instead of Lynn, then you're going to have to go maybe a little bit safer down the rest of the way. Um, yes. Let's talk about somebody who is absolutely unsafe, but could be a bargain based on AT's projections. Uh, we have to talk about Chris Sale. Um, so I'm not going to pretend that we know what we're going to get with him. Uh I haven't heard any recent reports. Obviously, it's too early. You know, we don't have any spring training news just yet. But how do you approach a guy like Sale if you're doing, let's say, an early draft? I mean, how early do you feel comfortable actually pulling the trigger, if at all? And right now, um, you know, he is at a 235 ADP. Uh, And, Nick, you have him returning profit of $9, one of the highest, not just in his range, but just overall. Uh, I mean, obviously, it could be a massive bargain here, but also could just, you know, totally implode on you and it could be a wasted pick. So, um, Nick, what, what's your take on sale right now? I'm not a believer. I'm until, you know, let alone right now when we don't, we really don't have any news. Um, but I, I, prior to all the injury issues, I, you know, I think we've talked a long time ago about this before. You know, I already had some issues with, uh, some hiccups in his giddy up, as it were. 
and so and then now all the injuries and like if the draft price was was rock bottom that's one thing but still like in the 230 range this much uncertainty and i i just i i have a hard time believing in him right away at that draft price given you know the injuries he's went through and the issues he had before then so this is one of the toughest things to do. And it's not just specifically Chris Sale. You can talk about Noah Syndergaard. You can talk about Luis Severino, although I think the timetable for Severino is maybe a little bit better than him. Um, you know, it really depends on what format you have. The NFBC plays in a non-trading format, in a format with no IL, no injured list. Um, you know right off the bat you're going to have half a year of just an empty roster spot if you roster sale, okay? With today's age with COVID, where you can have a whole team shut down, you can have players, you don't know what's doing, you need to have a bench. And if you're in, uh, if you're in, I don't care what the value is, if, if, I don't care if it's Mike Trout. If you, knew, if you knew Mike Trout would be out for half a year, right? And of course, you don't know if, he, if he's going to be great coming back, but if you knew for sure he's going to be out, it's very hard to roster a guy. Like the, 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 the price that you'd have to pay is so much lower. I, I, I wouldn't want to roster Chris Sale. And who knows what you're going to get. Um, you're not going to get the 3-2 ERA. You're probably going to get something around 4. Um, eight, the projections are very optimistic. Here's the thing why he appears to be a bargain. The projections are so optimistic. I have projections here that are listing at 115 innings. I, I don't think you're going to get 115 innings. That's ludicrous. I don't believe these projections whatsoever. And I, ATC is on the low side. I think I had like 88 innings for sale. I don't believe I, I don't believe it. I wouldn't draft it. My suggestion in these scenarios is, first of all, if, if you have not if you don't have an IL slot, you're going to have to somehow come up with a plan of why he's worth it over anybody else. And I don't think you can. So I think he's almost undraftable. Right. Um, but if you're going to actually compute the math for any of these guys who, who are having injuries, you need to think of how many innings and stress test. You want to stress test the number of innings. See what sales value computes if you throw 50 innings. See what his value computes at 80 innings. See what computes at 110 innings. If he's still a value and a bargain, even at 50 innings, and he's worth $4 at 50 innings and you know the market's at a dollar – you know, then we're talking something. So you need to stress test the number of innings when you're running your numbers, and you should run numbers for any of these. Um, you need to think of the risk management. On the plus side, though, um, and again, the reason why the reason why he is a value for some things is because you can, if you do have an IL slot, you can throw somebody else out there. You can throw a replacement level person, if it's anybody, he'll get you some stats, and then you'll have him to supplement it afterwards. In that case, he's actually worth more than his projections because you're getting his half value that's computed a whole year plus a replacement level value. Um, so it really depends on the format. And I think that the NFBC guys have it right. They're probably even too aggressive because it's sale. Um, but the same thing with Syndergaard and, and Severino. Like I, I, you don't have to win the league. So, so if somebody picks up sale and sale becomes a ten dollar pitcher on a full year basis because he has a great, great second half, good for him. Let him do good. You can still win your league without him. But you can severely hamper yourself if you select him. You, you will for sure severely because. If you're drafting him, you're drafting him to hold it. You're not going to draft him and spend the $4 or pick around and say, you know what? I really have a lot of injuries in my team, so I'm just going to let him go. Like, you, you know the story. It's not like he got injured and you don't know. You, you, you know he's out for, for half a year at least. So you're rostering him for the long haul. I, I mean, I just can't see it. Uh, so I'm fine if I pass on him. I'm fine if he's a wonderful bargain. I don't need that. I'd rather take a player in that round who's going to be counting stats who I can count on. Uh, I'm very risk averse when it comes to this. So that's those are a couple of things that I thought of for this, um, and uh, hopefully that gives you enough of uh, what to do. <laughs> yeah, basically we're not touching sale. That, that's pretty. That's easy, easy to do because I think that's kind of how I've approached it the last few years, anyways. But what about a guy? Let's put your risk aversion to the test here. What about Corey Kluber, who, by all accounts, looks like he could be healthy, but also uh, hasn't done a lot of pitching uh, lately? So, you know, signed with the Yankees. 
What's your uh, opinion? Because right now projections seem pretty favorable based on um, you know his ADP because a lot of people are obviously scared away. Uh, Nick, I, I kind of know your take on this because we talked about him last year. Uh, so I want to get Ariel's opinion first. Um, you know, Kluber, it really depends on uh, if he's healthy or not. Um, so I defer to the injury expert. Uh, I haven't talked to, with, with my uh, partner and my uh, podcast mate on the Beat the Shift podcast, Ruben Guy. He's really the guy to talk to. If his velocity is up and he's shown that in the practice, I can't tell you about long longevity, stability, and whatnot, but it's very possible. I mean, the Yankees t- took a, a decent gamble on him to give some innings. And, you know, he's a former elite pitcher. Uh, you know, he's a guy that I think you might want to take a gamble on. His price is pretty low. You don't have to have a lot of draft capital, and you're going to get something out of him, at least in the beginning. Um, you know, he's pitching at Yankee Stadium, so right off the bat, you know, the ratios aren't going to be fine. But, you know, um, he could fit. I can see him as a, as being worth the dollar amount. If he's healthy, I can see him getting the enough strikeouts. He'll get wins. Yankees are a good team. Um, I kind of like the draft price. I'm not gaga over, oh, my God, that you have to get him. But I can see the right scenario where you're there and you've constructed a team. And, okay, you know fifth pitcher or whatever it is, you know, let's, let's, let's give a chance on Kluber. Um, so I, I'll give him a, a thumbs up on this one. All right. And then you figure, you know, if there's a team that's going to do its due diligence and, you know, trust the guy, the Yankees, they, I mean, they obviously needed rotation help in the first place, but I think they wouldn't, you know, have gone with him if they didn't feel he was going to hold up. But so, of course, he said that. So Masahiro, so Masahiro Tanaka, okay. The Yanks passed on him, I guess. He signed a one-year, I don't know, seven or eight million dollar contract to go back in Japan. Kluber got more. Y- the Yankees obviously made a decision that they trusted Corey Kluber more than Masahiro Tanaka. Does that tell you that Tanaka is not trustworthy, or does it tell you that that Kluber is more, or both? Got to think that the Yankees did some research there, and um, I kind of believe it. I kind of believe that they're going to roll with him. So um, it's it's a positive. I think it's a positive word. Of course, everybody else in the whole baseball passed on Tanaka also. So it might be him. I don't know. True. All right. And Nick, I know you, you brought up the, the red flags with Kluber um, even before last year began. So uh, are you just completely out on him still? Oh, I, I couldn't. I could not be more out on Corey Kluber. I will not start him. I, I won't take him in any draft prize. I, I feel bad for everyone that rolls with him for the first couple starts of the year uh, in the AL East meat grinder, and he gives up nine home runs. Uh, I'm joking. I'm exaggerating. But I, you know, like we've talked about before, yeah, it, he had a really good 2018. You know, everyone writes off 2019 to the broken arm and then 2020 uh, injury again. So, uh, you know, so they write off the really bad 2019 that, you know, he was really good in 2018, but there were issues in the second half of the 2018 with uh, velocity and stuff. And uh, uh, he got pretty lucky and, you know, his, his numbers were really propped up at the end of 18, 2018 by facing some, some very bad teams uh, a number of times. So rolling into 2019, before the disastrous like 35 innings he had, before he got hit with the comebacker and broken his broke his arm. Uh, so I was already worried going into that, and then so all bad in 2019 for the small amount he was out there, uh, injured again in 2020, and now he goes to uh, you know a division that chews up pitchers. Uh, so I uh, I. Well, I, I, there's no point in me drafting him because I'm not going to start him even one time because I don't want my ratios to get blown up and everyone's going to be like, oh, what? I guess Corey Kluber is washed. Uh, so maybe I'm too aggressive on uh, what I think he is at this point in his career. But, you know, if this was Corey Kluber going to a, a pitcher friendly park uh, where he wasn't playing uh, some of the best teams in baseball most nights, then that would be a different story, but I just, this is not the picture and not the situation for me. And I was right there with you, you know, 
Saw the red flags myself. I, I was out on Kluber two years ago. I, there's nothing that's really going to convince me, even if he does make it through a full season, that he's going to be anything close to what he used to be. So I'm agreeing with you there. Um, so let's get to the end here as far as some guys who are farther down the draft list, uh, going for maybe a dollar or two in auctions that ADCs may be a little more favorable on, or maybe that you just think will outperform um, their projections. Some of the guys I've kind of noticed early, and again, ATC being a little more conservative, it's not going to, you know, forecast a breakout per se for any, you know, unproven player. But guys, like I see John Means could be a good value. Uh, Nathan Valdi, uh, of course, my boy Griffin Canning. Uh, who else jumps out to you, um, Ariel? Um, I, I, two guys, uh, Ivaldi, I, I, I like that you mentioned. Um, there's, there's nothing that, uh, you know the Red Sox asked him what to do, and 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 he he did it last year. He was a guy down the stretch that I find myself like taking for spot starts and streaming. We're getting into like the streaming stages over here, where you're not playing these guys every single time. Um, and if you know, just just like you said, he was in a really bad division. But he actually had a really good year in a very tough division, right? He had a three seven two ERA, and that was pitching against the Yankees and against the Blue Jays, and you know. Um, and at Camden Yards, um, I kind of like him. He's just steady Eddie, um, and I like volume at the end of the draft, and I, I, I kind of think Ivaldi is interesting um, when he starts. But again, he's a streamer. Um, Ryan Yarborough, um, I, I'm a fan of. I'm a fan of him. Um, he's always undervalued. The the issue, of course, is Tampa Bay doesn't have any pitcher throw more than five innings. Um, Will he be a bulk starter? Will he be a starter follower? Will he start? Who knows? But he's had very consistent stuff throughout. I mean, uh, he has a career ERA under four um, every year. He has a career whip of 1.15. Those are surface stats, but uh, he's been great. Um, you know, ground ball rate in the 40s. He doesn't have a propensity to give up home runs. Um, walk rate a tack high last year. Um, but it was fine uh, the year before. Um, doesn't give up much hard hit contact, only 25% hard hit contact. So he's a guy, and he pitches on a good team. The Rays are good, so you know, maybe they, they'll win the game in five innings. Uh, good value. People don't really think of him and consider him, but I thought he was pretty trustworthy. I've, I've had him on teams head-to-head -head and whatnot. Um, that's a guy I, I like late, later, uh, that – you know, if you need a staff, you need somebody reliable there. I like him. Yeah, Yarbrough, not, not the most exciting because he doesn't have really the highest strikeout numbers. But like you said, really safe for ratios, especially to bolster later on because um, he's great at inducing that soft contact. Uh, you know, a ground ball pitcher is always nice. With Aldi, I think what's interesting is I, I think he really could take another step forward. You know, a lot of people are probably scared away because of the injuries, which makes sense. But even after Tommy John, he, you know, he's had IL stints, I think, each of the last three seasons. But I noticed, because I was looking at him earlier, he he's raised his strikeout rate, I think it's like five straight seasons. He keeps going up and up, because even though the velocity yeah, has been the same, game. and not a great sign, because, of course, anybody know the injury history, but his velocity is the same as it was like five years ago, even before Tommy John. Wow. He's at 97 with a fastball. Yeah. And so that's a good sign, but he was always a high heat but low strikeout guy. Uh, kind of like Alcantara. And now all of a sudden, he's figured out how to change his mix. Uh, I think he got rid of his slider, and now he's putting it better in. So he's he's developed that. So if, if his strikeout numbers keep going up, I think he could be a great value, um, assuming he stays healthy, of course. All right, Nick, uh, who, do you, who yeah. are you looking at? Uh, I actually really like uh, Eovaldi as well. I've drafted him on both of the, both of the DC drafts that I've I've done so far in NFBC. I, I like his draft price. I like Ariel said, like the Red Sox just keep asking him to do different things and he just keeps doing it. And I was also, I, I ended up on a lot of my late season last year with a uh, streaming matchups and he just kind of hung around on my team. So I him again, uh, and that's just kind of, you know, if if up until that point you've already built your staff to kind of where you can absorb if you only get a hundred innings out of Evaldi. Right. Let me mention just one more guy. Um, another Red Sox. 
Uh, different kind of injury. Um, Eduardo Rodriguez. Eduardo Rodriguez has been so consistent over year over year. Um, he ramped up every year. Hundred innings. He not 2019. He was a 200 inning pitcher with 213 strikeouts. He's had ERAs under four all those years, um, and he was out for COVID for heart stuff. I spoke with Ruben about this. Nothing wrong with his arm. Nothing wrong with his shoulder. Nothing wrong with anything. He's gonna be back to pretty much you know himself. Now he might not pitch 200 innings this year because of the ramp up, but. He's a healthy guy with great stuff, and you're getting the discount because he didn't play last year. I kind of like Eduardo Rodriguez, um, maybe even better than some of the other guys I mentioned, uh, like even Yarborough, because he has he has upside, and he's consistently been like a $10 pitcher. You can get him pretty late these days. Um, Erod, yeah. Yeah, I I love the price, and I love the, you know, the, you know he's another just the boring consistency, and I haven't liked his price in previous years, but this year is so low. Uh, yeah. I do have my worries about, like, he is, you know, just from what information we've gotten from the players that uh, have have recovered from COVID. It seems like he really got it back. Like, it, 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 it has affected his heart, and uh, it seems his after effects were very lingering and long-lasting, so – that is, that's that's literally my 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 con- I mean it's a big concern, but that's my only concern. Sure. There's no concerns about his arm. Like I, I know, like he's he's very consistent. Uh, you know who had you know a bad case. You know who had a bad case last year. Uh, Freddie Freeman had a bad case last year. I, I was told he zapped him for a couple of weeks. I think he yeah. recovered. <laughs> yeah, he recovered. Uh, yeah, he yeah recovered a little bit. Uh, yeah. Rodriguez and then Juan Mancata is the other ones that uh, are the players that really talked about just what a hard time they had with it. So, but Rodriguez, like at, at his price, it's uh, I've avoided him in previous years just because I, I hated his draft price. But this year, I mean, it's 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 costing you nothing in the upside. Like like you said, is a, a ten dollar player kind of like he always is. Yeah, right now uh, ADP for Rodriguez is two twenty eight overall. The SP sixty five. I mean, that that's nothing really. Like I said, I think as long as you have realistic expectations, because you know prior to last year there were some people thinking the breakout was going to happen. You know, he's, he's all looks to be this dominant guy. I think we know what he is at this point. You know, he's going to get you a ERA probably in the high threes. You know, maybe low fours. Um, he's going to get you a fair amount of strikeouts. Two something, guys. Six pictures, FP sixty five. Yeah, I'll I'll take a a high threes with two hundred strike gap potential. I'll I'll take that. The price is low enough that if he bags, I cut him. You know, once a pitcher is really low, um, I don't need a lot of upside. Right, return on investment. Right, is the returns by by investment. If the investment is low enough, you don't need that big a return yeah. to make it worth it. If, so yeah, he's worth starting. Like he's you you've won that one and. You know, why would you, uh, you know, you have Eduardo Rodriguez around 230 or Chris Sale around 235. It's, yeah, you know, that's not even a, a question for me. I no, guess. for it's sure. Worlds it's, apart. It's no brainer there. And, and by the way, um, it, one trick that I do is the first week of the season, I hardly play any starters. I play like three starters, four starters. Like if you have Corey Kluber, if you have Erod, just wait a start to see if they're yeah, okay. Just wait. Just wait. You know, yeah. if they're garbage, so don't play them the first week. Um, play three starters, your top three, maybe four. Just play a bunch of relievers. I'll take a middle reliever off the waiver wire the first week and play them just to get a couple of ratio stuff in there. Um, totally you, don't ha- yeah. you don't have to play them the very first week. So they had a great start. Like, if, if, if you don't play Erod and he has a great start the first game, are you going to say, crap, I should have started him? Or are you going to say, look at this. Look at this pick that I got, right? I You're going to be happy, now. right? Yeah. So you're going to be happy. So be happy and don't pick him. Don't play Erod the first week. You'll be a happy man either way. And if he doesn't have a good game, yeah, thank God I didn't start him. You know? Everybody gets all antsy at the beginning of the season, and they just want to, they want to start every – they don't. want max amount of starts. Like every, every guy I drafted, I'm starting him. No, no I'm same boat. I'm drafted. I'm right. starting my top couple guys. Everybody else, like I am uh, right. very conservative. Like I'm okay right. with missing right. a, a, the good. Like, how much is that going to help me in a total right. season if I miss something like a, a points league? Points league, yeah. you know, you're going to play all your starters. But yeah. we're talking about a roto where ratio can be damaged. Don't play uh, him. So yeah. don't. 
I got to see what I have with you taking a picture in the two hundreds. Like I, I got to see what I have before right. you, you get right. to start. Now you've got like that. If he happens to pitch a shutout, you know, that's not going to win you your league in the first week of the season. Yeah. But a, a blow up, a disaster start that can put you on an eight ball really early. And then you're constantly digging, digging and try to get back from it. Like you said, and then, Right. You know, that, that right. just alters your strategies. So. Yeah, all those people in the future that, that they're going to start Corey Kluber at his first time at Yankee Stadium. He's going to give up eight earned and like 2.2. 2. And uh, that that's why you should yeah. just, just go slow on the trigger. Right, right. Absolutely. All right, well, that was our early look at ATC projections for starting pitchers. We'll do a hitter version, of course, very soon. Um but Ariel, thanks for joining us again. And uh, we're going to have a lot of written words on this matter. Nick, I know you're cooking up something already, talking about ADC overvalued, undervalued. And uh, we'll dig into some of these pitchers that we didn't talk about. Nick too. nominated for FSWA Writer of the Year. Don't forget that. Congratulations, Nick, on the nomination. Thank you very much. Yeah, one we, of these have, things we, have, like we have all the nominations at Rotobar. Like, uh, you know... The, the past winner in Arrow, we got a, a whole mess of people nominated this year. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we know we have great stuff coming out, and now, uh, now everyone's getting to learn that uh, we got the goods. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, y'all. Well, thanks for joining us, and uh, check in soon. WPC is back throughout preseason. Help you get ready, to dominate your drafts. All right, guys. Thanks for watching.